A Cessna 172 is one of the most forgiving airplanes ever built. It climbs, reliably stalls gently, and gives pilots time to think. It's an aircraft that has trained generations of aviators precisely because it gives you margins, time predictability, and room to recover. And yet, on this flight, a series of reasonable pilot decisions slowly led to a point where the crew had no safe options left. There was no engine failure, no loss of control, no reckless flying. Nothing dramatic happened all at once. Instead, this accident shows how a normal judgment call made in perfectly flyable weather can quietly become irreversible when terrain and wind begin to work against you. Not suddenly, not violently, but steadily until the airplane is no longer the limiting factor. Today we're going to take a careful look at what the pilots did, why those decisions made sense at the time, and how the environment transformed those decisions into a deadly trap. Let's begin with what we know for certain based strictly on the National Transportation Safety Board's final report and recorded data. The aircraft involved was a Cessna 172S Skyhawk SP registration, November 1727 Tango, with two occupants on board Devon Criddle 26 and Braden Raleigh 21. The airplane itself was mechanically sound with no evidence of engine malfunction, control system failure, or structural issues prior to the accident. Using ADS-B and radar data, investigators were able to reconstruct the flight's final segment with reasonable clarity. After departing, the aircraft proceeded into mountainous terrain following a path that brought it into an area of rising ground and narrowing terrain. Throughout this portion of the flight, the airplane remained below surrounding ridgelines, a detail that will become important later. Flight data shows that the aircraft made gradual climb attempts as it continued along this route. There was no abrupt loss of altitude, no sharp maneuvering, and no indication of aggressive flying. The profile instead suggests a steady effort to maintain altitude while progressing into terrain that continued to rise ahead. During the investigation, the surviving pilot provided a statement to authorities indicating that the aircraft had been caught in a downdraft. This is a critical piece of information because it aligns closely with the environmental conditions present that day and with what the flight data suggests about the airplane's performance in the final moments. Eventually, the aircraft impacted terrain. The impact sequence resulted in a post-crash fire which severely damaged the airframe. One occupant died at the scene. The other survived the initial impact but later succumbed to burn injuries after being transported for medical care. It's a tragic outcome and it's important to pause here and recognize that two young lives were lost, not because of a dramatic failure but during what began as a routine flight in a very common airplane. And when we step back and look at the evidence, one thing becomes immediately clear. Nothing in the data suggests a mechanical failure. The engine was producing power. The controls were intact. The airplane on paper was capable of climbing. So if the airplane was capable, what changed? To answer that question, we need to talk about something pilots can't see, but absolutely have to respect the vertical movement of air in mountainous environments. The NTSB noted that on the day of the accident, conditions were favorable for mountain wave activity. This doesn't mean severe weather in the traditional sense. There were no thunderstorms, no frontal systems moving through, and no obvious signs of violent turbulence at low levels. On the surface, it looked flyable. But mountain waves don't announce themselves the way storms do. When strong winds aloft encounter mountain ranges, the air doesn't simply flow over the terrain and continue on its way. Instead, it can begin to oscillate vertically, forming a wave pattern that extends far downwind of the mountains themselves. Think of it less like wind over a hill and more like water flowing over a submerged rock, rising, falling, and rising again. On the downwind side of these waves, the air can descend rapidly. These downdrafts are not gentle sink rates. They can reach hundreds or even thousands of feet per minute depending on wind strength and terrain shape. Here's the key point, and it's one that's easy to underestimate. If the air around your airplane is moving downward faster than your airplane can climb upward, full power will not save you. The airplane may be performing exactly as designed, but relative to the ground, it's still going down. The NTSB's performance modeling showed that the downdrafts present in this area were capable of exceeding the climb performance of the Cessna 172 involved. In other words, even with everything working normally, the airplane could find itself losing the battle simply because the atmosphere was stronger than the machine. This doesn't mean an accident is inevitable. Many aircraft encounter sinking air and fly away from it without incident. But the presence of downdrafts fundamentally changes the rules. Suddenly, climb performance becomes conditional, not guaranteed. It depends not just on engine power, but on where the air is moving. And that brings us to the next piece of the puzzle. Because the air alone doesn't cause accidents. 
The terrain determines whether you still have anywhere left to go. Once an aircraft enters mountainous terrain, the environment begins to impose constraints that aren't always obvious from the cockpit. Terrain doesn't just sit there as an obstacle. It actively shapes how much time, space, and flexibility a pilot has to respond when conditions change. In a canyon or valley system, terrain usually rises in the direction of flight. At the same time, the surrounding walls tend to converge gradually, narrowing the lateral space available to maneuver. This creates a subtle but important effect as the aircraft moves forward. It is simultaneously losing vertical clearance and horizontal freedom. Below ridgeline height, escape options become binary. Either the aircraft can climb above the terrain ahead, or it must be able to turn around before running out of room. There is no third option. And crucially, the farther an aircraft proceeds into rising terrain, the more demanding both of those options become. Turning around in confined terrain is often underestimated. It's not just about turning the airplane, it's about how much space that turn requires. Every turn requires bank. Bank increases load factor. An increased load factor raises stall speed. That means the airplane needs more airspeed to remain flying while turning than it does in straight and level flight. In calm conditions, with plenty of margin, that increase may be insignificant. But in turbulent air, or in an environment where vertical air movement is already reducing performance, that margin can shrink very quickly. Airspeed fluctuates. Vertical speed fluctuates. And the airplane can find itself operating much closer to its limits than the pilot may realize in real time. What makes terrain especially unforgiving is that it removes the ability to wait and see. There's rarely time to pause, reassess, or experiment. Once an aircraft commits below ridgeline height, the geometry of the terrain begins to dictate how long the pilot has to solve any emerging problem. This isn't a matter of skill or judgment. It's simply physics applied to a very constrained space. And with that in mind, we can now look at how these physical realities intersected with the decisions made during this flight. At the moment these decisions were being made, there was no clear signal that the flight was approaching a point of no return. The aircraft was functioning normally, engine power was available, visibility was sufficient. There were no sudden warnings, no abrupt changes, and no obvious cues that demanded an immediate turn back. From inside the cockpit, the situation likely appeared stable. The key commitment occurred gradually, continuing below ridgeline height into terrain that was steadily rising. At that point, the aircraft entered a situation where success depended on factors outside the pilot's direct control. Climb performance was no longer guaranteed by power alone, and turning around required increasing amounts of space time and margin. It's important to understand why this decision made sense. The Cessna 172 has a long-standing reputation for predictable, forgiving performance. It responds gently. It climbs steadily. It gives pilots confidence that if something needs correcting, there will usually be time to do it. Early portions of the flight likely reinforced that expectation. The airplane had been climbing. Nothing had suggested that conditions ahead would be fundamentally different. This is a very normal human tendency. When a system has been working reliably, we expect it to keep working at least in the near term. Pilots are not immune to this. In fact, aviation training often reinforces trust in consistent aircraft behavior. What changed wasn't the crew's intent or awareness. What changed was the environment's influence on the aircraft. As downdrafts became a factor, climb capability shifted from being something the airplane simply had to something that depended on where the air was moving at that exact moment. At the same time, terrain geometry reduced the crew's ability to stop, slow down, or easily reverse course. Options didn't disappear all at once. They narrowed progressively until only the least flexible options remained. This is what makes this accident particularly instructive. The decision itself wasn't unsafe when it was made. It became unsafe only because the conditions surrounding it evolved in a way that removed alternatives. This is not a story about poor judgment. It's a story about how reasonable decisions can become irreversible when margins quietly disappear. The core lesson here isn't about skill experience or even caution. It's about recognizing when a situation is consuming options faster than new ones can be created and understanding that by the time this becomes obvious, it may already be too late to change course. Accidents like this are difficult precisely because they don't hinge on dramatic failures or obvious mistakes. Instead, they reveal gaps between what we expect the environment to allow and what it actually does. One important lesson is that performance charts assume cooperative air. They describe what an airplane can do in still conditions, not what it can overcome when the atmosphere itself is moving vertically. In mountainous regions, that distinction becomes critical. Another lesson is that terrain decisions are inseparable from safety decisions. 
Where an aircraft is positioned relative to ridgelines, valleys, and escape routes often matters more than how well it is flown moment to moment. Terrain determines whether there is time to react when conditions change. Escape planning in mountainous areas isn't about pessimism, it's about realism. It acknowledges that when something unexpected happens, options can disappear faster than pilots are accustomed to in flatter environments. Planning for that loss of flexibility is not optional, it's foundational. And finally, this accident reminds us that even gentle forgiving airplanes can be overwhelmed by invisible forces. Not because they malfunction, and not because pilots fail, but because physics imposes limits that skill alone cannot overcome. Aviation rarely punishes big mistakes. It punishes small ones made in places where there's no room left to fix them. As we close, it's important to remember Devin Criddle and Braden Raleigh. Understanding what happened here isn't about blame. It's about learning how easily normal decisions can become traps when terrain and atmosphere quietly align against us. And perhaps the most valuable takeaway is this, when flying near mountains, it's not enough to ask whether the weather looks acceptable. We also have to ask whether the terrain is still giving us the freedom to change our minds. That's all for today's episode. Thank you for watching. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the next video.